While I wait for some parts to arrive for another project from uh, Mini Circuits, I'll get into that at some time in the future if I decide to make a video, but uh, partly just to uh, kill time and also because I have a couple of uses for these uh, stereo headphone amplifiers, I decided to assemble this uh, Ramsey kit. Now I have three of these that I bought because my understanding is Ramsey is getting out of the kit business or at least uh, these were on sale and uh, it looked like that they were closing out their kit line. So I bought three of them because I have a use for them. Uh, one use is just as a general amplifier to use with the analog discovery for doing experiments and so on. But I also use these to boost the output of the audio from an HDMI to video converter. I did a video, oh gosh, a year or so ago about HDMI converters. In other words, converting an HDMI signal to an analog uh, video audio signal. But that's another story. So what I thought I might do is use this as an example of how I assemble these little kits and you might see some ideas here at least I try to do it in a somewhat organized fashion the kit itself comes with uh, this is the actual kit a and then here are the pieces that are inside the kit obviously that one I just showed you is still boxed up it has an instruction manual. It comes with a uh, stereo uh, cord with RCA jacks on the end, a little uh, two-part black case printed circuit board, and then all of the components are in these bags. This is the front panel, and the, the basic idea is that before I start assembling this, what I do is get out the instruction manual and go through it. As I go through it, I try to identify every part to make sure first that I have everything I'm going to need and second, so that later as I'm assembling it, I don't, I'm not confused about where to find a part and accidentally install the wrong part because I think that this switch is supposed to be a single pole double throw and instead I uh, insert a single pole single throw or things like that. So this isn't intended as a dogmatic, this is the way you must assemble kits kind of video. It's just kind of a stream of consciousness how I do it most of the time. And I admit that one of the things I re believe about rules is there are always times that they can be broken. So uh, especially rules about things like hobbies. So uh, I'll uh, go through this. And if I find anything interesting in this, I'll point that out before I start uh, checking the components against the circuit board and so on. And then I'll start assembling everything. I've taken out some of the components from the plastic bag that uh, they came in. And I've arranged them on this paper over here. On the left is the parts list. Let's zoom in on that a little bit. There we are. You can see that they've broken them up. Now, not all kits are going to be arranged this way. This is the way that Ramsey did this kit. The semiconductors are put in one group. Initially, it shows two LM386 audio amplifiers. Those are over here. There are two of them there. It may be hard to see, but they're both uh, side by side. Then it has a 1N4002 rectifier diode. That's here. And let's uh, zoom in on that a little bit. Maybe we can see it a little better. And I'm doing this. I realize that most of you are going to know this already, but I'm doing this in case there is somebody who is coming to kit building for the first time. And when you read a description over in the parts list, it's nice to kind of know what the part is likely to look like. So the next item is a 
7810 voltage regulator. That looks this way. And you may hear people talk about this as a TO220 package. It just means that this particular arrangement of the leads here and the plastic case and the little heatsink uh, tab at the top. Then there are a series of resistors, and you may notice that the resistors have the color code red, black, gold, yellow, violet, red and so on. So here is the value of the resistor, here is the color code, and then here are the places on the circuit board where these go, and we'll talk about that when we assemble the circuit board. So those are the resistors there. Then at the bottom are two potentiometers. They're sometimes called POTS or volume controls. Uh, in this particular case, those are shown there as R3 and R4, two 10K potentiometers. Now, it doesn't say this, but these are actually audio taper potentiometers. There's two kinds, analog, uh, I'm sorry, uh, linear and audio. A linear is just, if it's halfway in the middle, then the resistance is half of the 10K value. In an audio potentiometer, the resistance is arranged in a nonlinear way to match the human ear, so that as you turn up the volume, about the same amount of turn on the volume control corresponds to about the same as your ear hears difference in value. You may have heard that your ear is actually logarithmic when it comes to its adjustments to volume. Then below that are a bunch of capacitors. Now I'll point this out and I'll show you all of them. On the left is the value, in this case 100 picofarads. It tells the type of capacitor, ceramic in this case, and we'll see in a minute that there also are electrolytic and sometimes there's mylar and some others, but basically this kit only has ceramic and electrolytic. And then over here, it has a really nice uh, touch. They put in here marked 101. And then, of course, over here, C7 and 8 is where they go on the board. So why would you get 101? Well, the way that capacitors like this are usually marked is the first two digits are shown here, 10, and then the number of zeros is the third digit. So in this case, it's 10 with one zero and that's in picofarads. So that's how you get 100 picofarads. So you might ask, well, how do you get 472? Well, that's 47 with two zeros, and that's 4,700 picofarads, or 0 0.0047 microfarads. 0 0.01 is marked either 0.01 it might be marked as 10N. In this particular kit, they're marked 103s, which means it's 10 and three, three zeros. And then finally, the 0.1 mic ceramics, notice it's 104. In other words, it has one more zero than this one. Then there are some electrolytics, but before we get there, let's take a look at those ceramic capacitors. Okay, there are the first ones. The second ones, the third ones, I'm not going to try to zoom in on those because, quite frankly, the markings are hard to read in general. But I will zoom in on these to show you, if I can get the camera to focus, that it says 104 on them. So, now let's take a look at the electrolytic capacitors. You'll notice that there are three types. The first is a 10 microfarad electrolytic capacitor, and there are four of those. The second type is a 220 microfarad, and there are two of those. And finally, there is a single 47 or 470 microfarad. Those are over here. There are the four. That of the first type, those are the 10 microfarads. 
Here are the two 220 microfarads and then a 470. So once again, we'll, we'll uh, mount those on the board. At this point, I have identified all of the electronic parts, that is the semiconductors, the resistors, and capacitors. There also are some miscellaneous, but I've left those in the bag, and we'll look at those a little later because some of those we don't mount until we've finished assembling the board. So let's get on with doing that, and uh, after we've got a few parts on the board, I'll uh, show you a little video of how I do that. What I'm going to be doing is assembling the board, and like I said, I've held out these parts until later. But uh, after going over the uh, parts list and making sure I have everything, I'll be putting the board together according to the instructions and so on. But if you're only interested in the finished board, what I suggest you do is perhaps uh, skip forward to part two. This will be a two-part. Part two will be from the point of having assembled the board through testing the board and checking its uh, characteristics, making sure that everything works, and then measuring its uh, specifications. And I do that based on some of the comments here on the front. You notice that it it says that it will work from 10 hertz to 100 kilohertz and almost one watt output per channel. I really suspect that's a that's an exaggeration. I think maybe a half a watt per channel is a little is pretty good for for the 386 and maybe even won't get there without substantial distortion. But that's okay for my application. That's going to work. And then I will be checking that it will operate on a 9-volt battery. Although for most of the applications that I'm going to use this for, I'll have a 12-volt power supply. But the reason I want the 9-volt battery is I would like this to be a safe project for people that are not used to working with electricity, and 9 volts generally is. So like any other electrical project, you do have to be careful, but this is at least low enough voltage that if you're a beginner, you don't have to worry about uh, it being lethal. But you can still blow up some parts with a 9-volt battery. And if you don't believe a 9-volt battery can give you a little shock, stick one on your tongue sometimes. <laughs> you won't do it twice. Well, anyway, skip forward if you want. Otherwise, stay tuned for the assembly. Here are the assembly instructions that are in the middle of this manual. I'm going to slide this over so I can zoom in a little bit more. And you'll notice it tells you to sort out all your parts and so on, which we've already done. I've always found it's a good idea to read through the entire manual once before you start doing anything. And as you go through, identify the parts so you know what they look like later. Now, one of the things that they point out that is important, it says use only rosin core solder or solder designed for you or to be used with electronic equipment. Now, this is rosin core solder. You see it says it on there very clearly. This is actually some old Archer 6040 solder that I bought before Radio Shack went out of business, or at least the ones in my area did. Here is an example of the kind of solder you do not want to use. Notice down here it says plumb shop. This is for plumbing. In this case, it's solid core solder. It doesn't have a core. If you try to use this, you'll find that it doesn't stick very well to the components or to the printed circuit board. And the reason is you need the rosin that's in the middle of the solder as a flux. The flux cleans the connections. So it allows the, them to, to make a better solder contact. Now there's an even worse kind of solder to use on electronics, and that is an acid core solder. I deliberately don't keep acid core solder around because I don't want it to get, ever get mixed up. Because if you use acid core solder on a printed circuit board like this, you very quickly find that 
the it will completely etch the uh, traces and you wind up with a piece of electronic equipment that if it ever works it won't work for very long because the acid is slowly eating away all of the connections and all the traces on the board so never use acid core solder always use rosin core solder now there are some newer solders that are including lead free and so on unfortunately you're going to find that you need to know a little bit about what you're doing to use those I suggest if you're just starting out that you stick with rosin core solder until you are a little more familiar with soldering and we'll talk about soldering when we get to that point so another point that it makes is save the excess leads because you'll need them to use for the nine jumpers so if you hadn't read that you might cut all the leads off throw them away and then when you get to this spot you say oh my gosh now what am I going to do so it says to orient the board in the same direction as the parts layout diagram so let's go to the parts layout diagram and do that on the left is the parts layout diagram now once again if your kit if you're not building this exact kit it may have a different layout diagram or a different way of showing you where to put the parts one thing I like about Ramsey is they silk screen the parts on the part side of the board so you notice here that for example the battery in the center here and then if you look at the silk screen you see that it has exactly the same picture printed on the front of the board here now the the components go on this side of the board this side of the board is where you solder the components so the leads come through and you may notice I'll try to get a little shiny uh, area there you notice that the uh, leads are pretty shiny if you look at your board and you see that they're not shiny what I suggest you do before you try to solder is get a little pencil eraser and just lightly rub the surfaces until they get a little more sh uh, a little shinier if the board has been laying around for years it may have acquired a little coating of oxide or of uh, oil and dust and so on so make sure you have fairly clean connections so now what I'm going to do is using the parts layout diagram and the description I'm going to start putting some parts on this board before I install U1 and U2 which are these little ICs here remember those are those LM386 amplifier ICs what I'm going to do is instead of soldering those directly into the board I'm going to use some little sockets now you can buy these from places like uh, DigiKey and Mauser and so on the reason I like to do that is not only does it allow you to leave the active parts out of the circuit while you test it initially making sure that you don't have the wrong voltages hooked up but also if you have to troubleshoot it's a whole lot easier to be able to pull the 386 out for example suppose that one works and the other doesn't and you suspect it's a bad chip well in this case since you have two and you know one is working you can plug it in here and make sure that works and then you can plug it in over here and make sure that works so it's a whole lot easier to use these the most kits don't come with these anymore in the old days many of them came with sockets they don't I suggest if you're going to be using uh, ICs uh, that is dip sockets that you get yourself a small quantity of of these sockets they come in this this these are eight pin uh, sockets I think that's eight pins yeah they also come in 14 pin and 16 pin and a number of others this particular board since it uses eight pins uh, per IC I used eight pin sockets I've installed the two sockets there now what I'm going to do is holding the sockets from this side I'm going to turn the board over and bend a corner pin out that way and then bend this corner pin out in the opposite direction so that it won't fall out when I go to solder it I'll do the same thing to this other one and then 
when we get to the soldering step, I'll show you how we solder those. Now you may have wondered, why did I put these in first? Well, I wanted to make sure there's room for these with the other components. So now we're going to do the resistors and capacitors and other things in the, in the order that they specify in the assembly instructions. And you may notice that it has a little checkbox. So it's a good idea to check the boxes as you complete that step so that if you get called away for some reason or decide to lay the project down for the night, you can come back the next day or the next hour or whatever and pick up where you left off without wondering, well now have I done that one yet? Or maybe I've already done this one but I didn't do that one or whatever. I recommend you just follow the instructions in the order they are given. Now I'll admit that once you've become skilled at this, a lot of people will just grab the board, grab the parts and start stuffing parts in. I found that almost all of the mistakes I make on kits are made when I do it that way. So even though I have probably assembled 400 or so kits over the last 50 years, I still have learned to go back and just follow the instructions. I've done the first step, orienting. Uh, this is the second step. It says install C4 that's marked 472, and I don't know if it's going to focus or not on the 472, but perhaps not. Let's see if I can get it to focus. Eh, maybe not. Even if it does, you probably can't read that. But that does say 472 on it. If you need a magnifying glass, uh, use that or a Truma's loop or whatever you prefer. And it says install that uh, in the correct location on the board, which is right here. Notice, though, that it says that ceramic capacitors have no polarity, so they may be installed in either direction. What they mean is that you can plug this in this way, or you can plug it in this way. Now, when we get to electrolytic capacitors like this one, that's no longer true. An electrolytic capacitor has a marking. You'll notice here there's a minus sign right there. In fact, it's repeated down here. And that means that this lead on this side is the negative lead. Just like a battery, you have to install an electrolytic capacitor with the negative where it's properly marked with the negative on the board, and the other side, of course, is the positive or plus lead. Now, instead of doing the uh, boring every one with inserting every component and so on, and also I'm not going to I'm not going to bother doing the Keystone Cops routine with loud music and all of that. Uh, instead, I'm just going to skip ahead to having installed all of the resistors and capacitors. I've reached the bottom of this first two pages here. Now up here when it installed the, uh, the voltage regulator, it said to solder the leads at that point. I waited. I'm going to solder the leads now. I waited till I installed these other three components, and I'll show you that in a minute. Now that kind of thing is, is certainly okay, and it's... Uh, violates my rule to follow the instructions exactly, but uh, it's not going to hurt in this case, and I'm actually doing that for a reason. The Generally, it's a good idea to mount some components and then get out your soldering iron and do all the soldering, The uh, as long as you don't miss any. And so I'll show you that, but another reason I wanted to delay the soldering until I got to the bottom of this page was I would like to show you a new soldering station that I bought recently that I think is a pretty good value. So let me get that out and uh, then we'll do some soldering. Here is the soldering station. You'll notice the it's called the Extronic LF. 3990, I think that is. Let me zero in on that a little bit and see if it shows up better in the camera. Yeah, there we are. I got this relatively inexpensively. It looks like uh, 399D. 
and you'll notice that the there's a little light here that blinks until it uh, comes up to temperature. It's now up to temperature. I'm going to turn it off for right now just to show you some of the other things. It comes with a nice soldering iron stand here as well as one of these uh, tip cleaners that uh, cleans the tip without uh, without corroding it like uh, like those water-filled sponges do. So I'm going to be using this to do the soldering and for that I'm also going to get out a little vise that I like to use that holds it. There are lots of ways to hold circuit boards while you solder them. Some people just like to lay them down on a bench, but I like to put mine in a little uh, vise. So let me do that and I'll show you the soldering. I've mounted the board now in this vise. It's just a, uh, a heavy base vise that allows you to to put this in and there's rubber uh, bumpers here that prevent you from uh, damaging the board. And now what I'm going to do, I have fired up the uh, soldering iron over there. So what I'm going to be doing is soldering the connections on the back of the board. Let me show you a little bit of what I've been doing so you'll get some idea. The, you'll notice that what I have done is cut off the, uh, the leads as they come through. And I've tried to make sure that I cut them off so that the, when the solder goes on, they won't lap over to an adjoining trace. Now this board is solder masked. In other words, there's a, an insulating layer over it with holes in the layer where the solder is intended to stick. But you shouldn't depend on that. You should make sure that you uh, locate these wires in such a way as they come through or the leads so that they don't short to the uh, to the next one over. And so, for example, here you need to be a little bit careful. But uh, a small tip and a, and a steady hand will, uh, will make this a pretty easy task. I've finished soldering the components on the on the back except for some of these more mechanical parts which I'll put on next. But before I put those on, the next thing I'm going to be doing is cleaning the board off with uh, with some alcohol degreaser. And then I'm going to be using a uh, magnifier like this to go down and look at every single connection to make sure that there aren't any shorts between them and that sort of thing. Then at that point I'll be ready to install the final components and then we'll move on to part two. I have finished mounting and soldering all of the parts, the switches, the potentiometers, the input jack, the headphone jack, the power connector, this is the battery cable. Be sure you get the red wire in the plus and the black wire in the minus. And the only thing remaining is to mount this uh, battery clip, which it needs a piece of wire threaded through from both sides. And I want to use some stronger wire. They suggest a little lead from a component. Frankly, they're not long enough. So this is probably the one place where I found that you can't actually build the kit from what they send you. You're going to need a little piece of wire or string or something to hold this battery clip down because by the time you have inserted a component in, even the components with the longest leads like these electrolytics, there's not a long enough lead left when you cut it off to go all the way around. Now you might be able to wire two together or some kludgy thing like that, but I'd just rather do it with a nice piece of wire. So uh, that's the only thing remaining on this. And then we'll start testing. You may notice I haven't put in the uh, op amps or the uh, audio amplifier chips yet. They go in these two sockets. And that's because I want to power it up and make sure everything is right and the voltages read about right and there are no shorts before I put those in. But that all will come in part two.
so stay tuned. <laughs>